Hello, my name is Rebecca Peebles. I'm the Director of Research and Quality Innovations at the Eating Disorder Assessment and Treatment Program at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I'm here to talk to you today about eating disorders in a weight biased world. So I wanna frame this talk with two separate kind of clinical issues that come up for us all the time. One is just comparing two girls the same age and ethnicity, both are 5'5", five five. both have lost 40 pounds in the last three months via restriction, diet pills, purging, and excessive exercise. Girl A has gone from 125 to 85 pounds, and girl B has gone from 260 to 220 pounds. So I don't have to tell you what's been ha what happens here. Girl A is screened for an eating disorder immediately and referred for treatment. Girl B is high five for her weight loss. Her mother, that's despite that her mother expresses concerns about her eating and exercise patterns, but still this young woman is not truly screened for an eating disorder until she's 130 pounds, and she's not referred until she's 110. And that is more than four times the length of illness that girl A had. And this is a common scenario. Another common clinical scenario comes up when we're talking about goal weights. So for patient A here, who had always grown along the 50th percentile, a societally accepted percentile for BMI, um, and then around puberty gained up to around the 75th percentile and then dropped to 83 pounds. I really don't ever have difficulties talking to someone or patients, families, other providers, and saying that they need to get back to between the 50th and 75th percentile BMI for age. Um, and whereas with girl B, who has the same pattern of growing around plus or minus the 85th percentile BMI for age, and then dropping drastically to around the 40th. Uh, the idea that this kid would need to go to between the 75th and the 95th percentile BMI for age uh, to get out of their eating disorder is really hard for people to lock onto as a goal. And they will often say things like, she looked better when she was a few pounds less. And what is this really healthy and is this okay? And these are things that hopefully you'll feel more confident uh, believing by the end of this talk. So weight stigma is pervasive, and this is part of why we literally just talked about two exact similar scenarios in a smaller, smaller kid and a larger bodied kid, and yet they were treated completely differently. Um, they impact all areas of a person's life, weight stigma. Weight stigma is learned early in this culture. Kids as young as six in studies have identified larger silhouettes without knowing anything else about them other than just the size of the silhouette as lazy, dirty, stupid, ugly cheats and liars. Weight stigma is present in people across the weight spectrum and it causes, definitely causes healthcare providers to treat larger bodies differently than smaller bodies. Size discrimination is the discrimination or prejudice against people of a different body size, and it's also known as sizeism. This occurs in healthcare all the time. 400 doctors in one study associated obesity, again, a weight stigmatizing word that I don't love, but it's part of the study, so I will quote it, with noncompliance, hostility, dishonesty, poor hygiene. And obese patients frequently receive less preventative care and doctors do fewer interventions. One study of nurses showed that nearly a third did not want to care for higher weight patients and nearly a quarter found that those patients repulsed them. A study of dietitians showed that only 1.4% of dietitians had a positive or even neutral attitude regarding higher weight individuals. In healthcare, doctors want to attribute everything to weight. So, you know, you go in with conjunctivitis and you walk out with a recommendation for weight loss, uh, which is absurd. <laughs> it's just literally absurd. But that this is something that doctors feel they need to intervene at every level on. They have been trained to do that. There are metrics for them to do this. And the idea is that larger bodies shouldn't be larger and that it's the cause of all healthcare problems. So patients avoid health screenings uh, when they have a larger body, and they are often denied health insurance or forced to pay higher premiums, so they have other barriers to care as well. 
So let's think about whether or not this is a true association. There's one study that's a really strong study that came out of uh, the CDC actually in um, and was published in the International Journal of Obesity. Um, and this is actually one of many that showed similar findings, that despite what we believe, which is there's so many beliefs that weight causes people to die if it's too high, um, instead actually looking at all-cause mortality of people across the weight spectrum has shown that in adults, that these people at very low BMIs or very high BMIs that have excelled at higher all-cause mortality, but that actually people with a BMI in the range of say 23 to 37 or actually have the lowest all-cause mortality. Size discrimination is really common. Michigan is the only state in the United States that prevents it by law. Six U.S. state cities have enacted similar laws within their city. Uh, but basically, that means that anywhere else in the country, if you are larger, you can be denied employment, you can be evicted from your housing, you can be denied at adoption, uh, all because of your size, and that that's legal. So going back to clinical work with kids with eating disorders, why is weight restoration important? And we're gonna bring it back to how that applies in patients with larger bodies and how we think about health at every size. So weight restoration, we know it's important. It's the, mo it's the thing that will most rapidly reverse medical complications in kids with eating disorders and, and all eating disorders have restrictive components. It's the single best predictive factor against relapse. It is the only thing that will lead to resuming normal growth and development that will lead to pubertal resumption after it's been arrested. And it does optimize brain functioning to get people back to a healthier weight. Weight suppression is something we know more about now over the last one to two decades. Um, and basically it's the idea, it first, when it first came out, it was the idea that there's a, the delta between the current weight that someone presents at and their highest pre-morbid weight, if they have an eating disorder, that that delta, that difference between the highest place they've ever lived and where they are at when they start treatment, that that's an important delta. That delta, that difference has been shown to, the larger it is, the more likely someone's gonna be depressed, have stronger eating disorder behaviors and cognitions, um, be less likely to get their period back when they're done with treatment, uh, and people with higher BMIs are more likely to have higher weight suppression even at the end of quality treatment. This has been shown to be true in bulimia, anorexia, younger and older patients. So we really try to set the bar high when we think about eating disorders and recovery. And um, we want people to really get well, and I'll talk about that more later. But to think about weight goals, we look at previous growth curves and we try now to avoid thoughts of weight bias and being afraid of where someone used to be because we want to reduce weight suppression. We want to look at their genetic potential, get their height to catch up, consider where they're at in puberty, and help them to reach a full recovery from both a pubertal perspective, a physical perspective, and a cognitive perspective. And that involves gaining weight and getting back to their true size. So weight suppression, when you don't do this, here's an example of what can happen in family-based treatment, for example. So this was a case series published in 2017 by authors I respect. Um, they looked at family-based treatment and atypical anorexia. That, that's a condition, for those of you who don't know, where people have anorexia but in a larger body. So they present after losing lots of weight in a quote-unquote normal weight range, around 100% of a median BMI on average in studies. Um, these patients during this course of treatment showed no significant change in percent median BMI from pre and post treatment. So they really didn't gain significant weight on average. Um, the average was they presented at 104% of a median BMI and they ended treatment at around 106. They do specify in the study that during the study period, there were no explicit guidelines provided to clinicians within the service for setting weight targets for adolescents with atypical AN. Findings suggest that this approach tended toward weight stabilization or modest weight gains for some, a deviation from the distinct focus on weight restoration in FBT for adolescents with just regular anorexia nervosa. And by the way, we all hate the term atypical because atypical anorexia is just anorexia. It's just in a larger body. In fact, only 37 to 52% of these patients were remitted, and it depended on what criteria you used. 
to get the higher remission rate, you had to say that they had reached a goal weight by just staying at their sick weight of around 100% of a median BMI. 38% still met criteria for atypical anorexia. 25% met criteria for UFED at the end of treatment. So the question is, can't we do better than this for our larger body patients? And is being fat actually worse than being sick? So when people are talking about recovery, we're in, in our program at least, and I think everywhere, we're trying to look for people to not just be functional, but be fully recovered. And with that thought, if a few additional pounds means return of periods, extra inches, increased flexibility about eating, less rigidity about exercise, improved mood, less anxiety, and reduced risk of relapse and chronic disease, why are we so worried about gaining weight in patients who are larger? So we aren't in our program anymore. We try to, we consider this for patients with prior higher weight. We try not to be afraid of previous growth curves. We try to address weight bias in families and patients and providers. Uh, we try to warn them to address weight bias with their other health providers by warning them not to talk about weight with their kids. Um, we remind them that it's normal for kids that are larger that, to keep gaining weight until their mid-20s, just like it's normal for kids who are smaller. And we do not ever recommend future weight loss. So when we get asked, okay, but when they get better from their eating disorder, then can they lose weight a healthy way? The answer is no, they, they cannot. Their brain has already shown itself to be quite rigid in states of negative energy balance. And any future trial of that is going to be dangerous for your child. And that's not a smart thing to do. Um, in addition, Weight loss diets are usually not effective no matter how they're done. So only 5 to 10% are successful in long-term studies at greater than a year. Most of the time, people gain to more than what they weighed before they went on a diet. The behaviors that people have to maintain to keep weight off or mimic eating disorder behaviors like compulsivity and exercise, restricted eating, um, and fewer macronutrients, uh, and uh, weighing yourself every day. So the bottom line is that if we know that 90 to 95% of the time dieting doesn't work and actually leads to long-term weight regain beyond where you started, and we also know yo-yo dieting is associated with negative health outcomes that are inflammatory in nature, why do we keep encouraging people to lose weight? Is it even ethical? And here's just a graphic showing someone, one of my patients who you know, started off at 150 at 14, wanted to go on a diet, went on a diet, certainly lost weight to 130, but then gained weight right back to more than they were at before. Went on a second diet, lost again, gained weight to more than they were before, used diet pills, lost weight again, more than that they were before after that, stopping the diet pills, started binge purging behaviors out of desperation, lost weight, and then ended up gaining about 60 pounds over four years, when really if they'd just been encouraged that their size was great the way they were at, probably would have really just gained you know, a normal amount of weight over the teenage years of 14 to 18, which would be far less. So what can we do instead? Health at every size is a paradigm, a belief, a legitimate treatment, um, in fact, even endorsed by the CDC these days. Um, that includes weight inclusivity, acknowledging that size diversity is a normal thing, health enhancement at any size, respectful care for people of all sizes, eating for well-being, and engaging in life-enhancing movement. It focuses on health, not weight, in practice. And we try to remember that when we're talking about behaviors and behaviors that promote health, weight is not a behavior. And we're not going to talk about changing your weight. Um, we remember that people of any size can develop a restrictive eating disorder, and we do not recommend weight loss as a goal. And we also expect that all children will not fit into the normal BMI range and that size diversity is a reality and a real thing and a healthy thing. Common myths about haze or health at every size is that, you know, it promotes that people, everyone's healthy no matter what, you know. That's not true. Not everyone may be at the weight that's right for them. Not everyone may be engaging in, in health-promoting behaviors. But the, the fact here is that efforts to lose weight are often futile and even harmful. And so the Hayes paradigm supports people in making good health choices regardless of their size. 
the Hayes message is also not another myth is that it's that people shouldn't be concerned about nutrition and activity. That's just baloney. It doesn't promote diets. So it talks about nutrition as being something that you should eat a wide variety of foods and you should eat foods you enjoy. You should eat when you're hungry, you should stop when you're full. Um, and that exercise is of course helpful for joy, for movement, for health, and that it's important. So these are really important parts of Hayes treatment actually. So finally, um, I just want you guys to take home from here that it's important to understand your genetics and that size diversity is a real thing and not to fight that all the time. We want to empower parents to understand that patients of all weights can get or have eating disorders and examine their own weight bias because everyone has weight bias. And so really step back and think about it and think about it if you're treating your larger children the same way you treat your smaller children. Um, Encourage patients of all sizes to embrace health and do not encourage them to change their size. And hopefully by doing this, we will do a lot less harm. So recovery is possible and it's individual to the patient and loved ones know it when they see it. This is a feast quote, I really believe it. I think you guys are critical allies in our partnership toward getting your kids better, um, no matter what their age is. And uh, I wanna thank Feast for inviting me today. Um, I want to also thank other people who contributed to these slides, Deborah Burgard, Leslie Williams, Rachel Milner, Carrie Heckert, and the Health at Every Size Development team. Uh, we're so grateful for all of their teachings. And uh, at the Ch Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, we've learned a lot from Hayes, and I hope it's something that you guys can learn from as well. Thanks.